Are you able to hear me? Yes. Okay, yep. very good. So I'm uh, Lawrence Kenyon, and I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Thomas J. Cummings, MD. He graduated from Rutgers New Jersey Medical School and completed pathology residency and neuropathology fellowship at Duke uh, University Medical Center. <clears throat> After fellowship, he joined the faculty at Duke and is now tenured professor of pathology and ophthalmology and is director of the neuropathology and ophthalmology pathology divisions. He is the pathology residency program director and secretary elect for the Association of Pathology Chairs Program Directors Section Council. He is a member of the Verhoff Zimmerman Ophthalmic Pathology Society and the Eastern Ophthalmic Pathology Society and has hosted both societies annual meeting at Duke. He has published over 150 papers and book chapters, won multiple teaching awards at Duke, taught and lectured on six continents, organized ophthalmic pathology courses at the United States and Canadian Academy of Pathology, published a book called Eye Pathology, a Concise Guide, and contributed to the fourth and fifth editions of the World Health Organization Tumors of the Eye Blue Book. Okay, so now, I guess we're ready to start. Dr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Dr. Kenyon. I'm uh, sorry, I'm having a little technical difficulty here. I need to press the uh, the presentation mode. Oops, now we have a C scene. Okay. There you go. Is that better? I think the um, the previous screen that you had up had the correct view. There you go. Perfect. Okay, we good to go? Yep, all set. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kenyon, Dr. Oviedo, Dr. Martinez Laga, and everyone at the AANP. I'm thrilled to be here and talk to you today about the pathology of glaucoma. I have no financial relationships. Our learning objectives, as you've seen, were to define glaucoma, the history, a little bit of the pathophysiology and classification, and then identify the normal anatomy and histology of the anterior chamber angle, the retina and the optic nerve, and identify the histological changes involving the anterior chamber angle, retina, and optic nerve that are associated with glaucoma. Uh, I hope in this talk there's something for everyone, and I think that will depend on what your level of exposure and experience with ophthalmic pathology has been during your residency, fellowship, and training. And I I thank Dr. Oviedo and Martinez for inviting me here and to talk about glaucoma. And I, my assumption is that glaucoma is perhaps not a common topic that we learn during pathology residency and even neuropathology fellowship. And you may not get you know, a, a solid lecture on the topic, but why, you know, why should we know about glaucoma? Well, simply the pathology of glaucoma involves the optic nerve and retina. Uh, to a certain degree, and these neuroglial tissues are of interest to us as neuropathologists. I would, if you want to do a non-scientific experiment, I've done it a few times. At the end of the day, just walk around your department, stop the first three, four, or five faculty, fellows, and residents that you run into, and just ask them, hey, tell me everything you know about glaucoma and the pathology of glaucoma, and there probably will be a lot of blank stares and not a lot of discussion. So therefore, I will go forward with uh, this lecture. Okay. So again, here's simply the, um, the outline that we'll go through. Let's talk a few minutes about uh, the definition, history, and pathophysiology of glaucoma. Um, many years ago in the New England Journal of Medicine, Dr. Rowland described glaucoma, meaning a, a sea green, 
uh, change or disease of the eye characterized by heightened intraocular tension and lessening the visual power that may proceed to blindness. The etiology is obscure. Now, uh, glaucoma is the second commonest cause of blindness worldwide. Cataracts are the leading cause of blindness worldwide, and I'll show you a few slides of that later in the, in the talk. But if you poll the general public, uh, cancer and blindness are generally our two greatest medical fears, along with a few others like heart attacks and dementia. But most people fear going blind, so therefore it's important to know about glaucoma. Unlike cataracts, vision loss in glaucoma is largely irreversible, and therefore it's important to uh, get this uh, diagnosed and treated as soon as possible. Glaucoma is a, uh, a worldwide, affects about 80 million individuals. This will be greater than 100 million by 2040, and more than 11 million people are blind from glaucoma. If you do a PubMed search, which I did just recently and type in the word glaucoma, you'll see there are about 81,000 uh, results. So there's a lot of interest in, uh, in better understanding and being able to treat and cure glaucoma. The history of glaucoma goes back to Hippocra uh, Hippocrates aphorisms. Of course, the famous book that begins with art is long, life is short, and how um, what that means is how uh, how difficult it can be to master any topic, and I think glaucoma would fit into this quite nicely. Hippo uh, Hippocrates' book came out in 400 BC. He referred to the term as glaucosis, and even Hippocrates was able to recognize the dimness of vision and eventual blindness. This is from uh, uh, the Glaucoma Journal of Ophthalmology a few years ago, and you see these early historical events with big names such as Hippocrates, Aristotle, Galen, Da Vinci, uh, von Helmholtz, and down the line, all talking about glaucoma. If they were interested in it hundreds of years ago and thousands of years ago, I think we can be interested in it today. Uh, Dr. Wells from Boston wrote in the New England Journal about 100 years ago the following statement. There is no brighter page in the history of ophthalmology than the successful treatment of glaucoma if diagnosed in its incipiency. But there is nothing more pathetic than the discovery of a neglected case. This neglect happens so frequently, notwithstanding the many warnings sounded by ophthalmologists, that it is evident that the general medical profession is not yet sufficiently impressed with the importance of the subject. So a lot of red flags about glaucoma. And even this day, when I see failed corneal grafts and blind painful eyes, and I read in the chart that the patient uh, was unable to take their glaucoma medicine and get their glaucoma drops because of they couldn't afford it or insurance, uh, problems. Again, here in the year 2022, that again may agree with Dr. Wells when he said that is uh, pretty pathetic. Okay, so the pathophysiology of glaucoma is simply related to the intraocular pressure, which is believed to play the major role in the development of the glaucomatous optic neuropathy and is considered the most significant risk factor. And how does this work? It works by disrupting the production or outflow of aqueous humor fluid in the anterior chamber angle that may lead to it, the increased intraocular pressure. The optic neuropathy secondarily then uh, may, may result in the loss of ganglion cells in the nerve fiber layer, layer of the retina. Pathophysiologically, the retinal ganglion cells are damaged by possibly ischemia or blockage of axonal flow in the lamina cubrosa, which are distorted by the high levels of the intraocular pressure. The blockage of the flow may deprive cells of brain-derived neurotrophic factors, whose absence then triggers programmed cell death in the retina. And this um, sparks a glial cell activation and neuroinflammatory processes, if ultimately leading in retinal ganglion cell damage. There are some beautiful papers recently in New England Journal uh, talking more in depth about the uh, pathophysiology of glaucoma. But I think a lot of these topics are pertinent to us as neuropathologists and even uh, those of us who practice neurodegenerative uh, diseases. 
increased pressure, stress on ganglion cells, reactive glial cells, tumor necrosis factor, apoptosis, neuroinflammatory processes. You know, a lot of these things seem to overlap with what we do in neuropathology. Here's another uh, excellent review by doctors Weinreb and colleagues of the pathophysiology and treatment of glaucoma with beautiful little illustrations of the lamina cribrosa and the, um, the retinal ganglion cell axons within the optic nerve leading to the apoptotic degeneration of these cells and the pathology that we ultimately are able to see when we examine globes from individuals with glaucoma. Again, the uh, molecular bi biology, you can really get deep into some um, hardcore basic science of glaucoma, all beginning, of course, with the increased intraocular pressure, putting stress on the optic nerve head and those astrocytes resulting in loss of axonal transport and so on down the line with cytochrome C and caspase cascade and glial activation and so on. And we could talk probably many hours just on the pathophysiology. A few facts about glaucoma. There is no cure for glaucoma. Lost vision cannot be regained. Glaucoma is a chronic condition that must be monitored for life. And similar to hypertension, if we think of hypertension as a silent killer, meaning you won't know you have it if you don't take your blood pressure and monitor your own blood pressure. Same thing with glaucoma. Glaucoma is a silent blinder. There may be no warning symptoms and you could uh, rapidly progress to uh, um, uh, loss of vision and eventually blindness. Everyone on earth is at risk from birth to elderly and knowledge, information, prevention, and treatment are really key. If you go to the American Academy of Ophthalmology website, you'll see uh, this guy is Bono. He's the lead singer in one of the biggest rock bands on earth called U2. And if you read here where my, I hope you can see my red um, laser, one of the biggest glaucoma-related news stories of 2014 was Bono's revelation that he has the condition. Bono is well known for wearing his uh, glasses and sunglasses essentially everywhere he goes, and he became really a leading spokesperson for glaucoma, and the American Academy of Ophthalmology was able then to uh, put out this nice um, um, you know, public service announcement, if you like, about how having glaucoma does not mean you have to go blind. Glaucoma treatments work. The earlier you get diagnosed, the better. And glaucoma may have no obvious symptoms in its early stage. So just to consider, uh, continue the public service announcement, I do not have glaucoma, but I do protect my eyes wherever I go. And some of my friends, I try and convince them they should always wear their shades to protect their eyes. Okay, let's get into the pathology of glaucoma. Uh, so we just, that was a little bit of the introduction. Let's get into we as pathologists and neuropathologists. We really need to uh, own it and learn it and know it. So let's talk about the retina, the optic nerve, and the anterior chamber angle. Here I just uh, give for you a, a picture of a normal globe. Uh, and quite simply, I think the best way for anyone to learn histology and then get deeper into the pathology is to get a slide of a normal benign uh, tissue and then open up a book like uh, with anatomy and histology, histology for pathologists or whatever book you prefer and go just um, tissue by tissue, layer by layer. And this is how I teach that the eye can be learned. You can, you can easily learn all the structures of the eye very quickly. You can begin in the front of the eye with the cornea, learn the layers, and then move out to the conjunctiva and the sclera, the ciliary body, the iris and the lens, the retina and the optic nerve, and then back into the orbital tissues. And if you, you take a good histology book and uh, you, can, you can rapidly learn everything in ophthalmic pathology, it's not that difficult. And I hope you are exposed to it in your neuropathology uh, training. This was a slide I put at a USCAP lecture I gave uh, a few years ago, where they want you to give a um, like a, a test type question. So I put which image of the retina is diagnostic for glaucoma? The one on the left, the one in the middle, okay. the one on the right. And hopefully you guessed the one in the middle, 
The image on the left is showing the normal macula layer of the retina where you have this multi-layered uh, ganglion cell layer with intact um, inner nuclear and outer nuclear layers. The image on the right is showing the peripheral retina with a few ganglion cells here in the um, nerve fiber layer. But the image in the middle, you see there's no um, ganglion cells visible. There's some atrophy of the uh, nerve fiber layer and some atrophy of the inner nuclear layer. And there's just a higher magnification of that middle view. Of course, down here is the retinal pigment epithelium and then the choroid underneath it with some melanocytes. Okay, let's talk about cupping of the optic nerve. This is one of the cardinal features you'll see in glaucoma. And the cupping of the disc or the optic nerve head or the papilla, all these terms are quite uh, interconnected and related. The cupping of the disc distinguishes glaucomatous optic atrophy from primary optic atrophy. Two more minutes, then we'll just go. The cupping also suggests that elevated intraocular pressure is a major risk factor in the pathogenesis of glaucomatous optic atrophy. And we will touch on Schnabel's degeneration and the lamina cribrosa, which are critical. Uh, lamina cribrosa is the, one of the critical anatomical sites of interest. Here is a rather low power magnification showing here peripherally the retina and then the cupping of the optic nerve head and the disc and maybe a little atrophy here in the subarachnoid space. Again, another view, some of the better uh, images I've had in my teaching collection. And just a quick contrast, uh, the difference, you can think of cupping of the disc versus papilledema. Papilledema is the opposite of cupping. It is a more prominent optic disc due to increased intracranial pressure. This is a case I had recently of a meningioma that was the patient was examined by ophthalmology presented with decreased vision. And here you see the optic nerve disc is markedly expanded forward compared to the nice sharp disc here in the normal eye. You may also have atrophy of the optic nerve, but without cupping in, in a non-glaucomatous optic nerve atrophy or degenerative eye disease. Here you see the optic um, nerve head is pretty much intact but the optic nerve is markedly atrophic. Okay, let's talk about the lamina cribrosa of the optic nerve head. This is the weakest part of the sclera through which the optic nerve and the central retinal artery and vein enter the globe. The lamina cribrosa, as we mentioned, may be affected by the increased intraocular pressure and then lead to abnormalities uh, associated with glaucoma progression, including the compression of axons and blockage of flow here on this higher power, you see the you see optic nerve glial tissue, and then the the um, the scleral fragments that kind of dissect and make it a sieve-like partition from which the optic nerve uh, enters and punctures the sclera and then goes back through the orbit. Schnabel's degeneration is a finding that sometimes you'll see in the optic nerves of uh, individuals with glaucoma that have been enucleated. This degeneration is a, an accumulation of hyaluronic acid or acid moly, mucopolysaccharide posterior to the lamina cribrosa. You can easily highlight this with alcyon blue or colloidal iron histochemical stains. There's a nice review of it in Archives of Pathology and Lab Medicine from Dr. Giorelli and colleagues. And the etiology is not entirely perfectly known, but it's believed to possibly be of vascular origin. And here you can see the cupping of the disc and then the lamina cribrosa and distal to the lamina, there are these um, mucopolysaccharide type filled spaces from a degeneration of the nerve. Here, of course, more commonly, if you practice ophthalmic pathology, you probably are more familiar with the lamina cribrosa uh, when we comment on it in cases of retinoblastoma. Here you see the retinoblastoma and the tumor cells uh, extending backward from the globe into the optic nerve and here at the level of the crossing lamina cribrosa scleral fibers. Okay, let's talk about the anterior chamber angle. The, this is a very uh, important histological landmark and 
again, if you go to a normal eye and just study these structures, I think you can easily get uh, very comfortable and familiar with it. The anterior border of the angle is lined by the corneal endothelium. Peripherally is lined by the trabecular meshwork and the anterior face of the ciliary body and iris root, and posteriorly, the anterior surface of the iris and pupillary portion of the lens. Here's a, here's a view of the normal chamber angle. Here's the cornea. Okay, decimase membrane will end. Here's the anterior angle. It's wide open. The trabecular meshwork, the ciliary body, the iris, and the lens. Remember the ciliary body functions almost like our choroid plexus does that forms cerebrospinal fluid. The ciliary body epithelium forms the aqueous humor that will then flow from the ciliary body between the iris and the lens into the anterior chamber and bathe our corneas. Okay, here are the key structures and landmarks of the anterior chamber angle. Number one, the scleral spur. This is simply the posterior edge of the trabecular meshwork. Schlem's canal, this is the lymphatic-like veinage drainage site for the aqueous humor out of the eye. The trabecular meshwork is connective tissue collagen beams that are responsible for helping with the flow, the outflow of the aqueous. And Schwab's line, also the posterior embryotoxon, Schwabe's line, demarcates the termination of decimase membrane and the anterior border of the trabecular meshwork. And I have pictures to show you this. It will become very clear and very easy. And a posterior embryotoxon is an anatomical nodular prominence of the termination of decimase membrane. Okay, so again, just another, um, just a lot of pictures to show you normal, so you get familiar with the normal open angle. Schlem's canal, trabecular meshwork, scleral spur will be right here. Here's the ciliary body musculature. Here's the sclera bending downward and forming at that junction. Anterior surface of the iris and cili ciliary body papillae. Okay, so let's go back to the scleral spur. As I mentioned, this is the attachment site for the ciliary body muscle. It is the posterior edge of the trabecular meshwork. And importantly for our ophthalmology clinicians, this is the clear landmark when the ophthalmologist looks in your eye with the gonioscope. If it's visualized, then by definition, the angle is open. And this is very critical in determining if someone may have an open angle versus a closed angle glaucoma. Okay, so let's label them. Schlem's canal, where the some blood cells, the scleral spur, okay. Here's the trabecular meshwork, the posterior edge of the ciliary body muscle, and sclera. Again, highlighted with some asterisks, Schlem's canal, these trabecular meshwork uh, collagen beams, and the red asterisk is the anterior ciliary body muscle inserting here at the junction of the posterior edge of the trabecular meshwork, right? Decimase membrane would be out here, Schwab's line right about here. Again, just an, another higher power view, scleral spur, trabecular meshwork, and Schlem's canal. Schwabe's line is the termination of decimase membrane and the anterior border of the trabecular meshwork. And as mentioned, the posterior embryo, embryotoxon is a thickening nodular prominence of Schwab's line. If you do a lot of ophthalmic pathology and you cut a lot of globes, uh, you probably know that you need a fortuitous section to really get a great uh, photographable section of the uh, embryotoxon. I see it maybe in fewer than I'd say three to 5% of globes that I section. And here it is. Here's the termination of decimase membrane. Here's the embryotoxon leading right into the trabecular meshwork and Schlem's canal. Again, just some pictures for your 
uh, it, when you review and to better understand it, decimase membrane and the posterior embryonotoxon. And again, you need a just a nice lucky section to really get it in its full its full bloom. What it probably is, it's thought to be your corneal endothelial cells here of decimase membrane somehow stimulating uh, posterior cornea and maybe trabecular meshwork to form a little nodule of collagen beams. Okay, let's um, move into the classification of the glaucomas. I hope that um, normal, basic, fundamental histology and anatomy was, was useful. How do our ophthalmology colleagues classify glaucoma and how does it relate to us as uh, neuro-ophthalmic pathologists examining these specimens? Well, there's a primary open angle glaucoma. There's a primary closed angle glaucoma. That's the case that we typically think of back to medical school, rotating in the emergency room where the patient uh, enters with a uh, painful red eye with headaches and seeing uh, rainbows and halos and other descriptive features. And um, that can be either an acute process when your angle is closed, or you can have chronic um, primary closed angle glaucoma in cases of exfoliation slash pseudo exfoliation, which are uh, very similarly re related. There are, there is the uh, main topic of congenital glaucoma and then so-called normal tension glaucoma, which is kind of uh, important and interesting. When you go for your annual ophthalmic exam, you'll probably have your cornea um, anesthetized and then they'll, they'll measure your, your intraocular pressure. And for most of us, it's between maybe 10 to 15 uh, millimeters of mercury, but some individuals may have a normal reading, but yet be afflicted by glaucoma. There's also a so-called low tension glaucoma where some pa patients have very low intraocular pressure, even lower than normal range, and they still develop glaucoma. And I think the only way to think of it is that each of us has different sensitivities to different levels of pressure. And so don't be surprised if somebody tells you, yeah, my IOP is normal, but I still have glaucoma. The primary glaucomas are the, the um, numbers wise, make up the most cases of glaucoma. However, what we are also very likely to see in our pathology practice are cases that get enucleated due to blindness or tysis bulbi from secondary glaucomas which may be non-acute and the angle may either be open or closed. A few words about primary open angle glaucoma. These are, this is an idiopathic disease. Patients may have no antecedent history. It is the most common type of glaucoma. It affects between one to 3% of the population and it is typical in, uh, typically occurs in older individuals. And this is, I think, you know, probably what a lot of us are talking about when we learn about glaucoma or are talking about glaucoma uh, with, with others. The visual loss is asymptomatic and painless, and therefore it, it can be the silent blinder, as we mentioned earlier. It is frequently bilateral, and uh, there may be a family history or there may not be. There's a nice review in New England Journal uh, in 2009 of the primary open angle glaucoma. On the right is a normal Humphrey visual field uh, uh, picture showing the blind spot, but this is an individual with normal vision. Here on the left, you see the superior and inferior arcuate arcades are blacked out, meaning this individual is suffering from uh, peripheral vision loss. And this is really the time when you want to uh, 
um, get diagnosed, get treated, and try not to let that progress if possible, because then eventually you will lead to central blindness. This is one of the key differences with age-related macular degeneration, which is typically a central blinding process. Initially, the glaucomas are more peripheral. The, uh, I, I was gonna mention at the beginning of the talk that you don't have to worry, there will be no molecular discussion in this talk, no, um, no next-gen sequencing, no um, integrated diagnoses, but there is a little bit to talk about with glaucoma about genetics and mutations. In the primary open angle glaucoma, mutations in the myosilin gene on chromosome one occur in a small percentage of patients. And, but that mutant myosilin protein is important because when you have an increased intraocular pressure, the reduced aqueous outflow through the Metzwerk and Schlem's canal is thought to potentially result in uh, intracellular aggravation of this mutant myosilin protein in these individuals. To the ophthalmologist, they determine the anterior chamber angle is open, and that's how the diagnosis can be made. This, uh, this is a uh, picture of a patient, as mentioned earlier, with a primary acute attack of a closed angle glaucoma. You see their left eye here is uh, red and angry looking. And this simply what happens is your peripheral iris might flop forward and become adherent or opposed to the trabecular meshwork and block outflow leading to an acute rise in intraocular pressure. And this picture was from uh, the New England Journal from a few years ago. I have no conflict of interest with New England Journal. I just simply like reading the journal every week and I learn a lot of general medicine by reading it. And frequently there's ophthalmology related topics. Okay, so here are a few side-by-side -side pictures of a closed angle on the right and the open angle on the left, just to compare. Here's a wide open angle with Schlem's Canal. Contrarily on this image, you see the iris has been pushed forward. It is right up against SMA's membrane. Schlem's Canal appears to be pushed back, and the angle is completely blocked off. This is also to remind me that I've, I have, uh, I've um, sent two glass slides of these cases that have been scanned in, and you can review them, and if we have time, we can go through them later. Slide number one is a nice open angle uh, globe Slide two that we are seeing here is a closed angle from that image I just showed you where the iris has been pushed forward and flopped forward and is completely blocking the angle. Here you see there's some cupping of the optic nerve posteriorly and you'd be able to see that in, in the, uh, the other slide of the open angle case that I sent. If you scan the retina, you will see the retina in both slides have essentially zero ganglion cells so the retinas have undergone severe chronic degeneration. Whoops. Okay, let's talk a little bit about congenital glaucoma, also known as ophthalmos, which is enlargement of the eye, so-called ox eye. And this is one of the clinical signs that you will see. There are some genetic relations to the um, cytochrome P450, CYP1B1 gene on chromosome two. And what this results in hypothetically is that your mesodermal sheet covering the trabecular meshwork becomes imperforate, leading to blockage of the angle. There may be a congenital absence of Schlem's canal and that persistence of the mesodermal sheath, uh, again, results in blockage of the angle. That tissue needs to regress and open the angle. And if it fails to, there will be a reduction in the ability of your aqueous humor to exit the eye. Histologically, we need to know about Hobbes strii. These are healed ruptures in Decimase membrane, and I'll show you a few pictures, but they are really one of the clinical hallmarks that you should see if you receive a congenital glaucoma blind eye. 
In addition to congenital glaucoma, we could also think of developmental glaucoma. And as neuropathologists, of course, familiar with neurofibromatosis type 1 and encephalotrigeminal angiomatosis Sturge Weber syndrome. In fact, uh, I just had a failed corneal uh, decimase membrane graft last week in an individual with Sturge Weber syndrome. So this stuff does happen, and you'll see these cases. Here's a, a case I had recently of a young child with congenital glaucoma who developed this um, blind, painful, enlarged eye. Obstrii, as we mentioned. So what happens is when decimase membrane ruptures, it will coil back on itself and form a scroll as it heals. And uh, again, just some more ophthalmic pathology knowledge here. If you see scrolls in a, in a decimase membrane, the three things you need to think of are obstrii of congenital glaucoma, keratoconus, where your conus, I'm sorry, your cornea uh, cones and the tension and traction on decimase causes it to rupture and you end up with corneal hydrops. Uh, in prolonged cases, you will then find the scrolls in the, in the, in the, um, when the corneas get excised. And also, I had a case recently of an obstetric forceps injury, which can rupture the child's uh, decimase membrane and may eventually result in you receiving the specimen. Here's a nice, um, I'm sorry, high power view. Here you see decimase membrane and the rupture, and then the membrane has thickened and formed this scroll, which is a histological hallmark. And again, just another high power. Okay, so those were the primary glaucomas. A quick discussion of the open angle and closed angle. And now let's talk about the secondary types of glaucoma. These are the ones that you, at least I anyway, in my practice tend to see more frequently on the surgical pathology bench. Although numbers wise, when you think about glaucoma, these secondary types of glaucoma are less frequent than the primary uh, open angle types. I've divided them into three sections. You can think of them as um, in the section of epithelial downgrowth, the ICE syndrome or iridocorneal endothelial syndrome and neovascular glaucoma. And I'll show you pictures of all of these. I like to group them together because you'll see that the glaucoma is caused by additional cellularity uh, affecting the outflow at the angles, specifically epithelial cells, decimase membrane, and blood vessels in the angle or on the surface of the iris. If you practice ophthalmic pathology, you've seen a share, your share of uh, anterior melanomas in the iris or ciliary body that then may then block the angle and lead to a so-called melanomalytic glaucoma if the tumor, of course, it is melanoma. Traumatic glaucoma, also very common, and pigmentary glaucoma. Other less common types are the pseudoexfoliative glaucomas, Orbital pathology, such as tumors or thyroid ophthalmopathy, or any pathological process in the orbit, mass forming lesion can raise your uh, intraocular pressure by directly compressing on the globe. And glaucoma can be associated with uveitis, so called uveitic glaucoma. Okay, so let's take that first cluster and talk about the epithelial downgrowth or ingrowth where your Ocular surface epithelium may uh, grow in and line the posterior cornea and trabecular meshwork, even onto the anterior surface of the iris and in severe cases along the surface of the retina and back to the optic nerve. You may have decimatization of the anterior surface of the iris in the ice syndrome. And finally, in diabetes, you uh, end up with neovascular glaucoma. Here's a case of epithelial downgrowth. Here's decimase membrane with the um, embryonal fetal layer. And here's stratified squamous epithelium along decimase membrane. 
You can prove that with a cytokarin and immunohistochemical stain. Of course, don't get fooled and think that you're really looking at the corneal epithelium and Bowman's layer. The clue there, of course, would be the embryonal fetal layer to help you avoid that mistake. Here's a case of the ice syndrome where decimase membrane has now grown into the angle and is lining the surface of the iris, which is blocking the angle. Also in these cases, you may get so-called ectropion uvi where the uh, iris pigment epithelium has been pulled anteriorly onto the anterior surface of the eye, of the iris, I'm sorry. In neovascular glaucoma, typically associated with diabetes, trauma, and tumors, most commonly retinoblastoma, where you get a new formation of abnormal blood vessels on the surface of the iris and within the anterior chamber angle. This, of course, blocks outflow and eye pressure increases. Here's a gross photo. The eye is essentially blind. Here you see this individual. The left eye is looking a little red and discolored from the neovascularization. Here on low magnification, you see there's a lot of inflammation from a uh, history of trauma. And as we go into higher magnification, you see this neovascularization and um, fibrovascular tissue completely blocking the angle. Another case of neovascular glaucoma where you get a line of blood vessels lining the surface of the iris. This is so-called iris neovascularization. Sometimes you just get small little capillary tufts or loops, also known as neovasc NVI, neovascularization of the iris. There's uh, some nice papers um, describing the neurovascular unit of the retina in diabetic retinopathy. And I thought it might be pertinent for this talk because we talk about the blood brain barrier, we talk about the blood nerve barrier, but Please also be aware there is a blood retina barrier and breakdown of this can lead to the angiogenesis that affects so many eyes. And eventually you get this neovascularization here of the surface of the iris in a diabetic. Okay, here's why you should um, pay attention to your eyes when you look in the mirror. You don't wanna find yourself with a, um, a melanoma hiding out in there and discoloring your iris. An anterior ciliary body melanoma, you could imagine, uh, can very easily block the angle. These are just some pictures for your teaching that I have in my collection that I've seen over the years. It's amazing that some of these individuals did not seek treatment earlier or ophthalmic uh, investigation, but you know that's how it goes sometimes. Again, some really impressive melanomas anteriorly busting through uh, the anterior chamber and through the conjunctiva onto the surface of the globe. Here's some gross image. You see the melanoma anteriorly and breaking through and lining the surface of the cornea even. Again, some histology of the melanoma. You see the angle, here's a ciliary body, the iris, the melanoma completely filling the angle. Here's a Mott-1 immunohistochemical stain. You see the red stained cells are in Schlem's canal. Again, just more pictures of the same for your teaching collection. Higher magnification, you can see decimase membrane here completely lined by epithelioid melanoma cells, melanoma involving the iris and blocking the angle. Okay, another type of um, glaucoma is so-called pigmentary glaucoma. Think of all these melanin pigment granules in the eye from our pigmented epithelium uh, layers. They can be released from the iris pigment epithelium post-trauma, for example. They can accumulate in the trabecular meshwork and dock in your trabecular meshwork and presumably clog up the meshwork and block the outflow through Schlem's canal. Many individuals suffer glaucoma secondary to trauma from penetrating or non-penetrating injuries. Here's a corneal graft. You can see the sutures. Uh, this is a uh, red conjunctiva sclera and a blind painful eye that will eventually make it to your surgical bench. Uh, uveitis or inflammation of the uveal tract 
may result commonly in anterior and posterior synechiae, where the iris becomes adherent to the cornea and the lens. Here's one of my cases where I had both in one slide, both in one section rather, the iris here adherent posteriorly to this retrocorneal um, fibrous tissue, and also to this summer ring ring cataract lens with this fibrovascular type growth. So both anterior and posterior synechiae in one image. Absolute glaucoma is the final stage of glaucoma. Some people might call it malignant glaucoma, but regardless, it results in complete disorganization uh, of the ocular, ocular contents, resulting in permanent complete visual loss. Here is again is a side by side of a normal globe on the left and Tysis bulbi on the left on the right with thickened sclera, complete disorganization of the ocular contents, and a optic nerve atrophy. Histologically, one of the, um, the hallmarks of Tysis bulbi is this um, ossification driven by retinal pigment epithelium and optic nerve atrophy. Here you can see bone uh, ossification. Sometimes you'll see bone marrow elements even occurring. Okay, so uh, I said earlier in the talk that cataracts were the most common cause of blindness worldwide. Glaucoma comes in as number two, but you see how this relation um, is very interrelated when you think of all the people with cataracts worldwide. Cataracts, of course, come from um, the vision. If you've ever been to Aguasso Falls in Brazil, you can actually go to these cataract uh, falls and see how the, the water leads to this kind of dimming or um, um, difficulty with fogginess or whatever you want to call it. That's where the word cataract comes from. And here are a few clinical views, although cataracts are common, secondary phacolytic glaucoma is rare. And essentially what happens is your lens fibers can leak through the capsule and block the trabecular meshwork and then get ingested by macrophages. I believe in most developed countries, you will have a cataract easily detected at an early stage here on the left. I think, uh, unfortunately, many cataracts lead to blindness in many places of the world, and their um, blindness is irreversible in these cases, and again, can lead to a secondary phacolytic glaucoma. Again, just um, normal histology, the normal lens, the lens capsule, the lens epithelial cells, and the cracked mud appearance of normal lens fibers. On the right, the swollen bladder or Weddell cells, kind of like your bladder urothelium as your urinary bladder expands to becoming full. And one fascinating point, you know, these epithelial cells of the lens are probably the only epithelial cells in the body that have never been associated with a malignancy. So that's some... Um, um, interesting ophthalmic epithelial cells there. Okay, that brings me to the end of the talk. It's been 50 minutes. Uh, these were the three questions, teaching questions I submitted that if you would like to go through, we can go through them quickly. The basic pathological abnormality involving the retina in primary glaucoma is, and the answer of course is C, degeneration of the retinal ganglion cells secondary to the um, intraocular pressure affecting the optic nerve and the pathophysiology in the optic nerve is one of the basic pathological abnormalities that we'll see in primary glaucoma. And then you can read through the other choices. Um, subretinal pigment epithelium drusen refers to age-related macular degeneration. Choice D, the cotton wool spots uh, re is referring there to the infarcts in the nerve fiber layer that occur in diabetic retinopathy. And photoreceptor degeneration and vasculitis just typically do not occur in glaucoma. The second question was cupping of the optic disc is associated with, and simply the answer is glaucomatous optic atrophy, as we discussed. 
secondary to the elevated intraocular pressure being the major risk factor. Colobomas are congenital defects that can involve optic nerve tissue. Um, pilocytic astrocytoma may result in expansion of the disc rather than cupping, and acute retinal necrosis does not typically result in cupping. The final question was to discuss the a little bit of the anatomy and histology, the anatomical nodular prominence of Schwab line, demarcating the termination of decimase membrane, and the anterior border of the trabecular meshwork is known as, and you know it as E, the posterior embryotoxon, which is that nodular prominence demarcating the termination of decimase and the anterior border of the trabecular meshwork, the scleral spur, Schlem's canal. You already know them quite well. And the pars plana is simply the merging of the ciliary body with the retina and the retinal pigment epithelium. So that I believe is the end. Thank you again to the AANP very much. Uh, please do not hesitate to email me at uh, thomas.cummings at duke.edu if you want to learn anything or talk about anything. I know this was going at a pretty good clip. And this picture, Yes, this is palisading necrosis in a glioblastoma, but I hope it shows my dedication to the optic nerve and optic chiasm. I think if you follow the laser, you'll see it kind of looks like the, uh, the palisading necrosis is in the shape of uh, the optic chiasm. And here's a pituitary stalk nestled right in there with some vascular proliferation. So again, thank you very much. I've really enjoyed being here. and. I'm happy to take any questions. Here we go. All right. So hopefully you can hear me. This, um, this is uh, now time to ask some questions. You can put them in the chat box. See if anybody's got any questions. So far, ah, okay. We have a question here from, uh, let's see, Hannah Harmson says, how do you sign these cases out, especially the primary glaucomatous processes, atrophia bulbi versus something else? Yes, great question. Can you still see my screen? I actually had a slide. Well, I see a, 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 an ocean scene here. Ah, here we go. Back to your PowerPoint. Okay. Here we go. So actually my final slide, if we had a few minutes, was how to write some diagnoses. And I simply, a lot of ophthalmic pathology is simply listing every abnormality you see. For example, you might get a cornea and the ophthalmologist is interested to know, is there vascularization? Is there scarring? Is there a lack of uh, corneal endothelial cells? Are they gutty, right? I, believe it or not, I received a call a few years ago from an ophthalmologist who said, I did a corneal transplant in a patient with a corneal dystrophy and I got back a diagnosis of negative for malignancy. And I go, and I say, yeah, I know it's not cancer. I just need to know the cornea was abnormal and all the abnormalities in it. So then I listed about 12 or 13 abnormal findings in the cornea. It's the same thing with the tysis bull by eye. And, you know, sadly in these, in these end stage cases, you may not find the smoking gun of why the eye went blind, even the glaucomatous changes. I would simply diagnose as tysis bulbi and then go tissue by tissue, neovascularization in the iris, anterior and posterior synechiae, ectropian uvi. And if you see the histological changes of glaucoma, you can write about the absence of retinal ganglion cells, the cupping of the disc, Maybe there's Schnabel's atrophy, atrophy of the optic nerve. And if you do have a, a uveal melanoma case, then you would list that the melanoma involves the iris, the ciliary body, the anterior chamber angle, the trabecular meshwork, and Schlem's canal. 
Okay, that's a very thorough answer. Um, I just want to mention, I kind of jumped ahead uh, before it said, when you submit questions via the chat box, please ensure the message is to everyone so that the presenters and attendees are able to see the question. Uh, to unmute, select the microphone in the lower left corner, and you might be able to ask um, directly. But anyway, here's another question from Peter Gould to everyone. It says, what immuno stains do you find helpful? Great question. I, I, I would say none. I really don't think I ever do immuno stains on a lot of these cases. Wow. <laughs> okay, so you must have a very rapid turnaround time. I, I think I had a slide. If you're if you're worried about epithelial downgrowth or ingrowth, I will confirm those with a cytokeratin stain, just to make sure it's not a multi-layering of the corneal endothelial cells or some other unusual thing. Okay. Um, don't seem to be any other questions. Wait, maybe somebody will. Dr. Gould and Dr. Hampson say thank you very much. Oh, here's a question from Howard Chang. Do you fix the globe in whole? I mean, fix the globe whole, I guess. Yeah, I, I typically let the globes fix overnight at least before I section them. I don't make any, I don't do anything to it. I just get it received in formal in from our eye center. And I don't, make any special um, holes in the eye to let it fix. In my experience, they fix just fine. Just let it sit overnight and formally. Just overnight? Yep. Okay. Good to know. Anybody else with a question? Well, it looks like we're at the end of the session. I'm sure uh, Dr. Cummings will be happy to answer any additional questions that might come to mind if you can email him. Um, and oh. I guess that's the end here. All right. Thank you again for joining today's AAMP Teaching Rounds presentation. Uh, we would ask that you take a few minutes to complete a short evaluation. Completion helps ensure accurate reporting to the accreditation board. A link to the evaluation uh, was sent out in the chat box. Otherwise, it will appear on your PATH LMS screen upon conclusion of the Zoom meeting or you can navigate back to the main course and select the evaluation option. Once you have completed the evaluation and selected your credit amount, please then select the appropriate certificate based on your credentials. The PowerPoint slides and recording will be posted to the AAMP website in the next week. Thank you again to Dr. Cummings for an excellent presentation and that concludes the session for today. Thank you very much. Thanks again. <laughs>